Welcome to the Healing Health Podcast. I'm Amber Petty. In this episode, I'll be talking to Professor Rob Carter from Deakin University's Institute for Health Transformation. We sat down to discuss his research into the cost effectiveness of health prevention strategies. So join us in the conversation now. When I was sent through your bio, Mm -hmm. there is a mountain of accolades and roles and awards under your name and your title during your career. But breaking it down in terms of what you do as a job, if you're invited to a dinner party that I'm at and I sit next to you, Rob, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And this person, lay person, how do you describe what your job is or all parts of your job? At one level, I'm a researcher and a teacher, Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one one level. In terms of the content, I'm in the area of economics. So, so what's yeah. economics about? Yeah, that's that's the question, uh, really, because I think we if, like <laughs> it's one of those things where you go, okay, we we yeah, we know it's sort of about that, but yeah. would like to look e- economics as a discipline mm. sees itself as an aid to decision making. Yeah, and essentially, right. what they mean by that is there's lots of needs and demands, etc., and not enough resources to do. So, how do yeah. you make decisions? Yeah, and if you're going to make decisions, on what criteria do mm. you make it? So economics is known to use a criteria of economic efficiency. Mm. So what that essentially means is the relationship between resources consumed and the outcomes should be good. Yes. And how, how do you judge that? Um, we, well, the way you judge it will depend on the particular technique, just to give an example. Mm. Uh, if you're using cost-benefit analysis, you measure costs and outcomes both in dollar terms. So if the benefit in dollar terms is higher than the cost, then you've got a net benefit and it's Mm. worthwhile. If you're using a technique that's more attuned to health, you'd be measuring outcomes in terms of quality adjusted life. So the length of life and the quality of that life. Yeah. And so you're thinking about which uh, interventions will help bring people back to full health, Mm. will help people in chronic pain, etc., and you would be measuring them in terms of cost per quality adjusted life you uh, achieve. So essentially it's a technique of saying how do we help people with limited budgets Mm. decide whether or not they're doing the best they can with the resources they have. Right. And then thinking really carefully Mm. about what does best you can mean, Mm. what does benefit mean. Yeah. And so what does that mean? How do you go about that? There are two answers. There's yeah. the big answer and the kind of more technical answer. We've got time. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> um, the uh, big answer is to come back and say, what do you want from your healthcare system? Yes, right. Do you And when we say we, we Australians? As in, we as in the community. The community, if we were yes. Asked to the, and this will vary from country to country. Yeah. If we were in Norway, for example, they would put solidarity or human value well before they, they'd put affordability or cost effectiveness. Oh, how etc. interesting. And what, so it so depends what do upon you... values. And so, so one of the things you've got to work out is, what, so let me go back track again to what is economics about? And it starts in philosophy, and it starts in philosophy in the sense of what kind of community do we want to live in and how do we achieve that with the resources that we have? So economics developed it as a way of saying, well, how do we achieve that, hence the resources? Mm. And so what kind of community? Well, we want a community whereby things are regarded as important, like education. Are you health. talking about Australia now yeah. or you're just, yes, yeah, okay. Well, well yes. more generally, but okay. all, but yeah. all yeah, yeah, yeah. any country, things that are regarded as important, you should have access to them yeah. on the basis of need Yes. as a right of citizenship, mm. not on your ability to pay for it. Because if you think about okay. markets, if markets answer three basic decisions, what to produce, how to produce it, and who gets access. You get access if you've got the money to pay for it and you're willing to. When we get into the health sector, we, we take the view that good health is so important to us as a community mm. in terms of the country we want to live in, we want everybody to have access to a certain level of health care yeah. on the basis of need. 
And so when we think about coming back to where we started about yeah. ha- how do you distribute a healthcare budget, well then what we're saying is economic efficiency is important or maximising healthcare is important, but who gets that healthcare? Yes, matters. yes. Um, that it's culturally acceptable matters. That it's acceptable to stakeholders matters. That it, it's affordable, i.e. Mm. use of your tax dollars is, is being done sensibly mm. because if you just do er- everything that's possible taxes would go up. Correct. And so it's a balancing act and saying, which comes back to the philosophy bit, what kind of society do we want to live in? What percentage of our resources do we want to put into health? Mm. When we're in the health, how do we spend that between care, palliative care, children, mm. prevention, Very et cetera? Serious. Yes. And how do you make those decisions? That's why economics is exciting because it, it's – it's those big decisions yeah. and trying to think of a structured way of dealing with that. It's fascinating, isn't it? And also just in terms of uh, I recently heard and I just wondered, I thought I'll throw this at Rob and see if he thinks it's something that is untrue or whether it's actually something that more of us should consider mm-hmm. is that if we don't transform, I know this sounding very sort of big in general, if we don't look at our Australian healthcare system, um, that we will we will steer our health system um, more and more closely to what the Americans That's have. That's really true. See, this is – so when I heard that, I thought, gosh, that sounds like a, a throwaway line that sounds terribly sort of dramatic and – no, because I don't think we would ever see ourselves, but, you know. So, so let yeah. me come back to your first question mm. and do it slightly differently. Sure. So the content of health economics has two basic parts. One is economic evaluation, all the cost-benefit stuff, you know. Uh, how do you spend the money you have effectively? Yeah. The other part is what we loosely called health economics, and it goes to markets. So mm. you know, when do markets work? Uh, what's market failure? How do governments, you know, when should governments intervene? Government failure, how do you prevent that? Mm. Then you go into health insurance, Mm. so the whole design about health insurance. Mm. But then you go into the financing and organisation of the healthcare system. So the financing and organisation of the healthcare system basically says, well, what percentage should the government... So in Australia, 67% of health services is paid by government. The rest we pay for privately, out-of-pocket expenses, private health insurance. So there's the where the money comes from, mm. but it's also who owns what. Mm. And so private sector ownership and provision, like a lot of general practice, versus government ownership and provision, like hospitals. Mm-hmm. Then you go into who regulates. So we'd probably say, yes, government should regulate. Mm. But when you get into where the money comes from, whether it's the government and how you use government money and who provides, mm. this is where the American model Mm. comes in mm. because, for example, a lot of their health insurance is actually takes place within companies, whereas yeah, we that's go right. for social health insurance like the UK and the Nordic countries and the Netherlands, etc. It's kind of what we might loosely call a social welfare state. Yes. And what you're looking at, coming back to principles and values, mm. is individual responsibility, rewards for hard work, yeah. right? That which heavily drives the American system. Totally. You get what you earned. Yeah. And also, they shouldn't get what uh, they didn't earn. Exactly right. Which is, uh, that's, I find that, that question and that attitude in itself quite fascinating because I've seen people ask that question that normally I would have thought were more compassionate people in other aspects yeah. of their life. But they really, that is so ingrained in them, this attitude of, um, they shouldn't have that because they didn't earn it. And if I am wor- working so hard, why do they get that for free? Yeah. Let's let's use two terms that come from philosophy. Yeah. And that is uh, egalitarianism mm-hmm. and uh, libertarianism. So, yeah. so the notion of liberty yes. is that you can do whatever you wish, that mm-hmm. your choices should be unfettered unless you do things that harm others. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the notion that therefore is... Very much the American model, very yeah. much the liberal government here. And, you know, small g government, minimum interference, reward people for what they do, uh, and there's a, therefore poverty and you know ha- handouts etc. should be minimised. Mm. Egalitarianism, which is much more the Labor Party and the social welfare states, is much more about 
focusing on what kind of country you want to live in, mm. making sure that there are minimal levels of income, minimal access to health, mm, mm. minimal ac- access to education, mm. etc., and that your right of citizenship to be looked after, if you can't look after yourself, which we call solidarity, is an inherent part of the country. And so this is why the values and mm. principles and the philosophy becomes quite important because it's, it's that kind of fabric that yeah. sets up the finance and organisation of the healthcare system. Yes. It sets up government provision versus private sector provision that differentiates an American economy heavily based on uh, libertarianism from a country that gives more regard to egalitarianism. Yeah. So where do we need to watch ourselves in Australia that we don't steer we over to? We have to be very careful that we don't create two-class healthcare system. Yeah, right. Okay. So yep. in other words, that part of the resources yeah. that that is government paid for mm. out of our healthcare care system is the right balance compared to what you would pay for. So most of us would probably think that if you were going for some beauty treatment, yeah. you should pay for that. Yeah. We, we shouldn't have... Well, I don't. I think that should be on so. Medicare. <laughs> 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 the growth hormone, don't worry about me. The, the growth therapy and some of these issues, IVF treatment, for example. Yeah, I'm people, sure that's Some one people will argue think. that the right of motherhood is really important and the state should pay for it. Others will say, look, purely from a state perspective, we have enough babies. We have enough people. Yeah. If you really want to have a baby, and it's expensive. that's something for you. Yeah. Uh, erectile dysfunction for men. Some yeah, people yeah. W- would say, look, that's important, but if you, w- you want that. So you get this interesting notion yes. about... You know the intervention's important, you know it works, you know it's cost effective, but should it be provided for as part of health insurance mm. or should you pay for it if you have the ability to? So in the in the American model, there'll be much more you pay for it. Yeah. Minimum and it's always for. been like that. Has, so that's, it has that's an entrenched, I guess. Much less regulation, much less role of economic analysis. You know, pharmaceutical companies rule a lot more in terms of if it works, they'll get it on the market. Yeah. A lot less people covered. I mean, for example, there was an example of priority setting in the state of Oregon some years ago where 450,000 people had no health insurance whatsoever. Wow. So you have a lot of people, uh, you know, at, at or below the poverty line who have no insurance. Yeah. And, and so these are some of the differences from a country that's driven by reward for merit, merit-based. Yeah. You work hard, you should be rewarded for that. Yes. Right? And there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, there's something. But how do you balance that with reasonable uh, uh, rights and citizenship, the kind of country, you know, solidarity? And what do you consider disadvantaged? How do you define it? Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what, they're not working hard enough? They're not working. So, you know, so one way of doing that is that you pro- – that, that, that – Assistance for either those below the poverty line mm. or who, who need income support should be provided by, say, government out of taxes mm. rather than mm. through private charity. But they should never be better off than those who are not getting it. Mm. Yes. Okay. So because yeah. And that's where you start to get into these more difficult issues about encouraging people into the workforce versus those who, oh, I can't be bothered working, I'll just live off the pension. Yeah. You know, uh, and all those really kind of interesting issues. So why is this a concern in Australia in terms of our system? Is it governments like the governments that are edging towards not, you know, okay. funding certain, like what is... What? Uh, there's a couple of issues. Um, if, we, if we think very broadly, then you start with, what areas should government intervene? Yeah. As soon as you say that, you're saying government role as a regulator versus taxation. Mm. You would, so you want your taxes to be minimal, mm. basically. Most of us would. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and you want that money to be sent, spent sensibly between what we would regard as reasonable government roles around defence of the nation, police force, health, mm. education, energy, etc. So part of that then is what percentage of the budget or to go to health. Many years ago it was 6.5%, now it's closer to 14%. So that health is consuming a far bigger percentage of the budget. In fact, it's bigger than mining, for example. Right. Most people wouldn't realise. That's a no. huge industry. Yeah. Yeah. It's very la- labour intense. And so part of it then is, okay, well, is that a good size? You know, yeah. Should we be controlling that, which means 
new medical technologies don't yes. come in, or you look at them very carefully. New drugs don't get put on Medicare. Yeah. And so there's this issue about what are you prepared to pay for or what percentage mm. of the budget do you think ought, ought to go to health? Mm. And then within health, how much should go to palliative care so that the dying process is, is as dignified and pain-free as it can be, mm. through to care, care in terms of bringing people back, you know, life-saving, bringing yep. people back to full health or, or as good as it can be, say burns victims, mm. right through to chronic care, etc., right through to prevention, which takes you into screening, immunisation, behavioural change, mm. drugs, physical activity, nutrition, etc. So trying to make all those kind of choices, that's where my profession comes yeah, in, in yeah. terms of saying, because my research area is economic evaluation and trying to advise governments mm. on where they spend their money. Now, the way it tends to work in Australia is that there's a focus on specific diseases or specific risk factors. So we think about obesity prevention, we'll have a policy for that. Mm. We'll think about diabetes and we'll have a policy for that. Mm. We'll think about cardiovascular disease or we'll think about respiratory disease or we'll think about cancers. Mm. So we tend to do what in my terminology would be vertical priority setting. We think about a particular issue mm. and try to set priorities within that and we just kind of accept the amount of money that, that's available there. Right. Other countries have tried to do a cross and try to, to set a cr cross and... Uh, across all those things. And so countries do it differently. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about um, some of the research that you've been involved with that I know has got um, a lot of attention and, and certainly by the government. So the accessing cost effectiveness, aka ACE, mm -hmm. um, in prevention study. Yep. What is what is that research and that study okay. about? That particular study um, was an academically led one in the mm. sense that the idea for it came from us. It wasn't a commissioned one like some of the other studies. Yeah. Um, we got funding for that out of our National Health and Medical Research Council. Mm. And in our application, we said that one of the things that's missing in terms of the generation of new knowledge, which is what NHMRC is about, yeah. generation of new knowledge that's relevant and helpful, was... Uh, cost effectiveness information on a whole range of, of interventions to help prevention, so to help to to prevent illness, okay, and, and and to promote good health. And what we did was to look at 150 interventions. Wow! And that's huge. So most of the time, we look at one intervention. Yeah. We look at should we have breast cancer screening? Yes. For, for example, or should we have this new immunisation thing? What we tried to do is to say. The body of evidence in this general area of prevention... How much, yeah, in terms how much of, of, like, this big research... Yeah, so the, whole, lots the whole area of prevention versus care versus yeah. cure, etc. The body of evidence to help people make decisions is not very good. And so what we, what we wanted to do is to adopt appropriate techniques mm. that would look at a big problem. And this comes back to a, a different reason in terms of my challenge personally. Because mm. I was a bureaucrat. Before I was an academic, I was mm. actually a bureaucrat in government. And one of the things that I thought was lacking in the economics discipline was economic advice provided in a way that was helpful mm. in the health area. What I meant by that is governments tend to make decisions about policies. Mm. You know, what are we going to do about cancer? What are we going to do about respiratory disease? Mm. How do we deal with diabetes? Whereas what economists were tending to do is look at single things. Mm. So what we needed was what I call priority setting, where you look at multiple things. Mm. So therefore, if, if you look at what's different about the ACE work is that it looks at multiple interventions, so within mental health or cardiovascular disease mm. or prevention, um, because that's the more helpful kind of advice, and that's what we did with prevention. We, we were trying to increase the available information across risk factors like alcohol, like tobacco, mm. like diet, yeah. um, and, and to also think about diseases and to look at it both for the general population and also for the indigenous population mm. um, and to adopt a technique and approach where well, that actually worked. I mean, mm. coming into the more technical side of stuff, thinking of a way of doing that in terms of the modelling, the data sets, all mm. the rest of it, 
uh, is very challenging. And so that I, was I one of imagine. the inno- that was one of the innovative things in terms of how we did that. So so that we did the rigorous bit, if you like, well. Yeah. Which was a combination of economics and epidemiology and modelling and all that sort of stuff. But we also had regard to broader factors like equity and acceptability, et cetera. And the other thing we did, which is uh, a key part of the ACE approach, is we involved stakeholders so that we, we had a, a working party with Indigenous people on it, we had a working party with general population kind of people on it, and we're always working with stakeholders in terms of uh, what options we look at, how we evaluate them, where the data comes from, how mm. you should interpret the results. So it's very much an explicit process of trying to arrive at decisions, but making sure you have due process. Mm. You carry people with you on that journey. Yeah. And so sorry. So you've got 150 different um, yes. health uh, issues. Mm-hmm. You're looking at why prevention across the board Mm -hmm. of all of the top sort of illnesses and disease in Australia. What was the output? Like what was the collective message that you were driving to governments? There's a few of them. Because obviously I can see how, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, my policymaker and sitting there saying... Oh, what are we going to do about obesity? <laughs> 150 okay. issues later, so what we do, it'd be great if you walked in the door and said, "I've got you 150, and I've got an answer." What, what is that? What okay. we? Yeah. So what we did, we approached that in a couple of ways. We, in simple terms, we basically put our results into buckets. Yeah. So the first bucket was dominance. So in other words, this is a group of intervention that both saves money and it produces health gain. Low hanging fruit. Okay. Yeah. Real, because it's dominant, it's really cost effective. Um, the next bucket is things that are cost effective but are not dominant. And what we have is, is a reference value that says less than 50,000 per quality is regarded as being cost effective. Sorry, the do- when you refer to dominance, uh, uh, what, what does that mean? Dominance means interventions yeah. that the cost offsets are, are greater than the cost of the intervention. So you get a cost saving. Okay, so, so what's an example of that? An like? example might be that if you reduce um, excessive alcohol consumption in the community... Got it, yep. ...and you have regard to the reduction in health costs, you have regard yep. to the improvement in productivity of people at the workforce, mm-hmm. if you have, re- have regard to the lower crashes, the lower court costs, the lower police costs, yep. less people in hospitals, that those savings, when you model them out, are much bigger than the actual cost of the intervention. Right, gotcha. And so would that also relate to um, a discussion that I had with um, Professor Anna Peters in regards to, you know, food and the, um, you know, the impact that has or the burden that has on, you know, disease and our healthcare system or, you know, the mm-hmm. correlation between, for, you know, food and uh, disease. Yes, And her work looking into food environments going, okay, well, let's not talk about the individual. Let's talk about the big overarching environment. Yeah, that would be like what you would say, like the dominance, you know, if we go into a food environment and try and change that, then the the snowball effect from that. Yeah, yeah. Is that sort of a little bit like that? It could work out that way. What What you're getting into is rather than looking at a specific intervention, have a think yeah. about the system or the, or the world within which people... The dominating live. influence or, or system. Uh, it's, system. It's more just the influences. Yeah. Um, so in other words, try to make healthy choices easy choices. Yeah, yeah. So if you think about today's society with mums working and all the rest of it, you've got Maccas you know, all yeah, over the yeah. place and, and you come home, then it's easier probably to do fried chips and a pie yeah. or go to Maccas than, than it is to, to cook healthy food. Yeah. And so today's environment, so what you're trying to do, that's called an obesogenic environment. Yeah. It's harder to be healthy because we're stressed, we're yeah. short on time, we don't grow our own food, yeah. uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there the intervention would be probably a combination of education, yeah. educating people mm. um, to try to you know, eat the right kind of food. In the area of, say, alcohol, we, and there was an nice A study in alcohol, yeah. But it also applies to, to obesity prevention. One of the things that we know that we know is simple to do, 
mm. has a big impact and governments can do it if they choose, mm. is regulation of advertising and or Right, taxes. like smoking and smoking, uh, advertising. Yeah, um, um, hours of operation, numbers of outlets, um, the tax on products. So you would have seen, for example, over and above the revenue raising, the tax has been going up and up and up on cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. And one of the, one of the issues that has really driven the fall in in cigarette smoking in Australia has been plain package, you know, plain packet mm. packaging, mm. increasing taxes, etc. Uh, um, trying to control advertising. Yeah. So that that's the environment. Yeah. All of that stuff uh, impacts on how and when products are available, yeah. how and when they're advertised. To who are they advertised? Mm. Um, quality standards. Mm. Uh, making sure you understand that if you you consume dangerous products, you actually understand it's addictive and it's dangerous. Yeah, and you know that. Yeah. So there are things that governments can do, mm. and a lot of those kinds of things, if they're politically palatable, are dominant because mm. they don't cost much. The impact is ongoing, right? Whereas behavioural change, we tend to fall back in bad ways. Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, people are constantly going on diets. Yeah. Constantly, we, we know that there are decay rates. So in other words, different types of interventions... Mm. Uh, will have different impacts in terms of the number of people they affect, the decay rate, uh, etc. And so that's the balance we're trying trying to get to in terms of governments doing things that basically are in regulations, governments doing things in terms of funding drugs or funding services in hospitals or funding community health centres, uh, etc. So there's all sorts of ways in which Governments can take a lead and do things. The question is, which are the best ones and how yeah. do you decide best? Partnering with businesses big and small, Deakin offers world-class research and development expertise, first-rate facilities and global leading talent to develop game-changing solutions. Ranked in the top 1% of universities globally, Deakin is a world leader in research across multiple industries. Whether it's tackling the challenges of health systems in society, developing future materials for a circular economy, or shining a light on a brighter energy future, Deakin Research can take your business to the next level. To find out more, head to deakin.edu.au slash collaboration. Deakin, more than a university. So getting back to the ACE study, yep. and you've got the overarching message or, or data that... Oh, yeah, that's right. So yeah. where, where weren't we? So what we did was to basically say we presented the information in different ways. We basically said three key things. Are they cost effective? Do they have a big impact? And are they affordable? You've got to present all that work you've done yeah. in a really simple way. Yes. And so, in other words, is it value for money and how do you determine that? So we put it into buckets and, we, and then we, we tied that with a funding one and said, if you want to fund mm. all the ones that are dominant, mm. it'll cost you $5 million and this is the flow, you know, we graphed it, this is when the benefits come in, this is when you, you pay for it, this is when the cost offsets come in. And so we give them this picture uh, about you know the things you really ought to do, and then yeah. we'll say, here's the next group of twenty or thirty things you ought to do. Yeah. Not quite as cost effective, um, not quite as good on some of these other things. All right. So we we try to present it in a way that the government can say, like, we'll spend five million or billion, and we'll grab that group. Mm. Now the other way, if we give them information, is to say, you want to do something in cardiovascular disease. Here's the top 10 things in cardiovascular mm, disease. Mm. Or you want to do something in cancer? Here's the top 10 things. You want to do something in diet and nutrition? Here's a few, th few things you should do, mm. but here's some things you should not do. They're not cost effective. Mm. So, for example, in that diet and nutrition space, mm. we looked at about 18 or 19 different interventions in that space. Some of them were not cost effective. What were some of the... So they were uh, sorts of things where you had expensive practitioners simply providing advice to people. They weren't getting sustained or a lot of change happening, and so they were quite expensive ways of trying to impact diet nutrition. So they're, they're actually people that are out there... Yeah, programs that have been tried... That have been funded by the government... That are yep. literally people going, okay, I'm going to stand here and uh, we're, ha we're having a consultation and you're going to be able to get this covered by Medicare or, or what have you. Yeah. But I'm, but I'm then off as the patient and it's not really having much value because... Yeah. 
And, and so, so basically, and, and that's where the information can become dangerous for someone like me. So that we're basically saying, if you wish to address diet and nutrition, and there's good reasons why you should do that, yeah. there's a range of programs out there. Some are cost effective, include, which are great. Yeah. Do more of those or yeah. do them. Yes, yes. Some are not cost effective. Do less of those. What it doesn't mean is that you don't do anything about diet and nutrition. Yeah. Because one of the problems we had when age prevention went out is that the Queensland government, for example, saw the, saw the notion that some of the, the nutrition programs were not value for money and they stopped doing anything. Wow. And that's not what we want. What we Who gets to make a decision like well, that? it happens within, you know, it may suit them politically or whatever. Sounds like such a childish kind of response, like, oh, it's all too much. Yeah. <laughs> And so, so, or, so or there's it's kind of a, an ethics thing on us, as, uh, you know, a bit like doctors try to do no harm or do good. Mm. Well, we've got, kind of got the same thing about we've got to be very careful that what we say is valid mm. and it's presented in, in a way and you try to interpret it correctly for people and you, and you basically say doing things in relation to diet and nutrition is really important because it's a major risk factor. However... Use your money wisely. The government did act in some way based yep. on your study. What did that look well, like? We've, done it. we've actually done a few studies in the obesity space. Yeah. One of the earlier studies we did, which was a commissioned piece of work by the Victorian government, was looking at obesity prevention in adolescence. And, we looked, and that was an earlier version of space, and we looked at about 12 or 13 interventions in the end. And we looked at a range of things from healthy canteens in schools, mm-hmm. provision of, of water bubblers, restricting outlets for alco- alcohol or, or operating hours, uh, TV advertising, particularly for children, etc. So there's a range of things. And mm. this is where that working party I mentioned comes in. So on that working party was the state government, yeah. was the Commonwealth government, was people who had content expertise in alcohol prevention, their economists, etc. And so that was one... Then we went on to age prevention, which had a diet, nutrition, BMI, or body mass index area. We did this for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous mm. people, general population. And then the one you've got over there is another obesity prevention one because it's mm. becoming such a huge risk factor. But it's really interesting because that one is not looking at the health sector. It's looking outside oh. the health sector and saying, if you really want to affect obesity... Mm you've really got to do a lot of structural things in terms of how transport works, uh, you know, all this stuff. Really? Like, yeah, absolutely. But what... To, Pu- what public health encourage people to, to walk, encourage people oh. to catch public transport, encourage people out of cars, what we call stealth interventions. So you may do it for another reason, but at the same time, it's helping you stay healthy. So when you go into a building, the first thing you see is this really attractive set of steps. Yeah. And the lifts are on the back side. And right. So this the is the whole design of buildings. Is, the whole design of our urban like landscape. You put really nice walking paths in communities. Mm. But all this is about intersectoral. Mm. It's saying health is. It, it's a kind of. Uh, it, it's relevant to a lot of things. It's a, relevant to environment and clean air, mm. uh, non polluted water. It's relevant to urban design. It's relevant to public health transport. That's one of the reason why you want good public transport as opposed to total reliance on cars. Yeah. Walking school bus, for example, uh, which was an approach where you try to encourage um, kids to walk to school as, as uh-huh. opposed to being driven. So, so that's quite popular in, in various countries. But we do we did, do that here? We, yeah, we did an evaluation of walking school bus and we really? found it wasn't actually cost effective. The reason it wasn't cost effective was because of the way in which it was implemented, not because it wasn't a good idea, but because the process you had to go through to get all the roads inspected so that they were safe, the police checks and all the people who could walk with them, oh. um, and then the fact that not enough people actually used them because there's so much kiss and ride now and so much mums taking the kids to school. So that, that, that's an example of maybe Kiss not and yet. ride. Or, <laughs> yeah. Have you heard that one? No. Oh, no, if you go to some of the public schools, you, yeah. you, you, you'll see that... Um, uh, mum's being encouraged to not come in just to, you know, drop the kids off and kids going. Oh, right, gotcha, or, gotcha. <laughs> or, or you take hubby to the station or yeah. whatever. Or, yeah. you know, or you drop. I, I thought it 
when you like, drop him off on the way and you say, good night, bye, and off you go on the yeah. public transport. Yeah. So you try and encourage people, A, to use public transport yeah. or not to use their car. Yeah. Uh, and there's all sorts of ways of trying to do that. And so that didn't work out in terms of like being cost effective the, to, to get point, people to, to at walk. At the point that we looked at it, the way in which it was provided in Victoria was yeah. not cost effective. Right. doesn't mean it couldn't be made cost effective. And we said, so the other thing we do is we, if we come up with an answer like that, we mm. say, this is what's driving your current cost structure, mm. right? If you keep that cost structure, you've got to improve capacity utilisation. Mm. You know, more kids have to do it or you have to drop your cost structure. So we try to help decision makers work out how they can improve that relationship between cost and outcomes. Mm. We've got to sort of finish up soon. You've done an enormous amount of interesting work and you've, as I said, when you arrived before we started um, recording, or yes. maybe we had started recording, I, I don't know, I've been <laughs> lost in the interesting conversation. Um, you know, you've been you've got received a lot of awards. Is there something kind of like in your career, like what are you most proud of and what have you found the most interesting, I guess, either research or, or it could be any part of your role like what's what's been okay. so two really, things I yeah think. two things that i'm proud of one was creating an effective unit here at deacon mm -hmm. um, because most of us as as we uh, um, progress through our chosen research area like to create a center of excellence or a center of expertise yeah and one of the challenging things as an academic is you have to go and earn the money to grow that, you have to find the money. Yeah, and, yes. And, and so, and so, winning research grants and commissions. Yeah, which you did a lot of. So Why are you good at that? <laughs> Hang on, let me just start. Okay, on target. let me start on target for a minute. Sure. So, so basically, winning sufficient money to grow my team from three or four when mm. I arrived to thirty plus. Wow. In the space of sort of twelve years, so I'm proud of that. Yes, yeah, so you should that, be. That the turnover rate is low and people are happy and it's a good workplace or all that kind of. Uh, as a leader, creating yeah. something that, you know, goes on after me. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud of that. And I That's think the, the other thing that I'm um, – it's kind of a legacy, I suppose. The other thing that I'm proud of is this technique or approach to priority setting whereby I think I've enhanced the ability of my discipline to be helpful in a, in a real concrete way. Mm. So sorry, what do you, can you explain what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is – that the way in which economic evaluation is conducted yep. using the ACE approach yes. and thinking about the whole way in which priorities yes. are set yep. as opposed the to... The roadmap you've words, created. Instead of saying, should we have a bowel cancer screening program, what should our cancer program look like yeah. across the board? Yes. And providing a way in which my discipline can make a useful input to that and work with other disciplines. Yeah like work with behavioural science on, on consensus-based approach, work with epidemiologists on needs-based approaches, understand the political science input. So that particular topic um, is something that I've done a lot of work on mm. over the last 10, 15 years, so I'm mm. proud of that. Mm. It's an enormous amount of work. How do you relax? How's your unwind? Because that's a lot of thinking <laughs> and processing and strategising and formatting. Um, well, more so now that I'm sort of... You've got a bit more time, retired. yeah. But in terms, basically, exercise in my garden. Yeah. So I love exercise. I've always done something. Yeah. Um, and I love my garden. That, that's where I meditate. That's where I connect. Yeah, connecting with nature. Yeah. Is that something that um, is gardening become interested in, interesting to you as you've got older or is it something I've that's always, always loved been? It. I've always loved, loved gardens. And I've always, my dad was a builder. Oh, okay. So very early on, I could have become a builder, but uh, that was an earlier choice as to how I got to where I was. I, no offence, but thank God you didn't. At, at one point, I was going to be a builder. But um, anyway, so so I love building, creating things in the garden and growing vegetables. And just, I just find it really fantastic, just that connection. Grounding, you know? Yes. Like absolutely. walking on lush grass with bare feet. Yeah. It's kind of like a grounding. Yeah, beautiful. So love it. Yeah. Thank you for your time and thank That's you right. for your conversation. And thank you for an incredible body of work that has just, gosh, I mean, you know, if you could do a little heat map of where your 
research and your work has gone in Australia. It'd be amazing. It'd be amazing. Yeah, it's all over the place. All right. I'll let you go back to your garden now, Rob. (laughs) It's a bit grey and cold out there. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining in the conversation with us about our healthcare system. If you'd like more information on any of the topics or researchers in this series, simply head to iht.deakin.edu.au.